two things of ending a trial that you probably don't. Number one is we really fail. We do. And we'll go to bed tonight hungry. So we are really, we are also blessed with some really good talent. Uh, I really appreciate the, I appreciate Beth's family have pushed me into things I would never have thought I would do. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when she puts out the the list of the special project for I think six months at a time, my name is on there. And folks, I my voice is used for speaking. Uh, singing is, uh, I'll sing with somebody. It terrifies others. And so, but I really appreciate the talent we have here. And Emily, thank you. You wrote the words and the music. That was impressive. And uh, Randa, thank you for coming all the way from Alaska to do that. <laughs> so when do you have to leave Thursday we'll, we'll be praying for you oh by the way Carrie you and Beth did okay too <laughs> well next Sunday we're going to look at the Christmas and the Sunday after that different aspects of it uh, we're not going to do that today simply because I have something else planned. And I hope that um, that what you hear today will set the stage for what happens uh, the rest of this month. So take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Mark chapter 1. If we just look at two verses, 14 and 15 this morning. This is really the actual beginning of Jesus' ministry. If you remember the last time we were together, John has baptized Jesus. And then verse 12, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there 40 days being tempted by the devil. And now in verse 14, that's where we pick up today. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you for this passage. I pray that it will become clear as to what you are telling us. Thank you for this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this section of chapter 1 in Mark, we find the actual beginning of Jesus' ministry. We've considered before the word immediately, and it appears more in, in Mark's gospel than any of the other gospels. And that word, well, it appears a lot in chapter 1. Uh, Mark is heading towards an event of epic proportions when I when he uses that terminology. Uh, and we know that event that he's pointing to is the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ, his arrest, his crucifixion, his death, and his burial, and his resurrection. Now, it's not that the other events in this gospel are unimportant, but I think you and I know the culmination of Jesus' ministry happened at the cross, his work on the cross for sinners. So Mark records the events as happening quickly, even though this would have taken place over a period of three, three and a half years. So keep this in mind as we work our way through this gospel. But in this text, we find the beginning of the Galilean ministry of Jesus. We saw in John that Galilee was Jesus' base because he came back to this area more than once. So let's consider this, these two verses, and when we do, we will find four one-word questions that help us see what is being said. When did this happen? 
where did it happen, what really happened, and why did it happen. So let's consider the way this falls in the text and what it teaches us about the beginning of Jesus. The first question is, when did this happen? You see that in the first part of 14. After John the baptizer was arrested and imprisoned, we don't learn much about this situation until chapter 6. We're not going to turn there, but Mike, Mark writes this expecting his audience to know that this has already happened, to have previous knowledge of John's arrest. That's why he writes so little about it right here. And I think it was one commentator said, one witness of the truth is silenced, but another is raised up. So you got John being silenced and then Jesus coming on the scene. And that's not the first time that happens in Scripture, by the way, because think of it. After Moses came Joshua. And by the way, Joshua's name is the Old Testament equivalent of Jesus. Now he is a Old Testament type, but also after Stephen was killed, Paul came on the scene. So God, oftentimes when one is silenced, God will raise another up. Now, if you know the story, Herod arrested John because John told him it was illegal for him to have his brother's wife. That would be his sister-in-law. Of course, Herod did not care if he was breaking God's law, like many people today. But John told Herod the truth anyway, and we find out in chapter 6 that John used, or that Herod liked Listen to John. Isn't that important? Interesting. Herod, breaking God's law, would often listen to John the Baptist preaching. You know who else in history that reminds me of? Two people. John Bunyan, that wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. One of his most ardent supporters was a man named John Owen called the Prince of the Puritans. John Owen had what we would call today a PhD, brilliant theologian. Wrote some of the, well, he wrote a seven-volume commentary on the book of Hebrews, the largest that's ever been written. Isn't it amazing you can write more on a Bible book than the length of the book itself? But John Owen used to go to listen to John Bunyan preach in his Friends and compadres would say, why do you listen to that tinker? And John Owen, a man with great learning, would say, if I had his gifts, I would gladly give up all my learning. <coughs> and that's not the first time that's happened in history. In our own country, George Whitfield, the great evangelist that came to New England, and he even came as far south as Georgia in his ministry that basically we believe brought in the Great Awakening. Uh, you know, one of the men in our history as a country that used to listen to him preach and really enjoyed listening to Whitfield was Benjamin Franklin would go to listen to George Whitfield. So Herod in this situation liked to listen to John. And the details we have of this are few, but we are told in Leviticus 20, verse 21, that it is abhorrent or disgusting or repugnant or repulsive for a man to have his brother's wife. And Herod ignored this command, and John called him out publicly. Therefore, John was arrested and put in prison. So be careful when you call people out publicly. I'm not telling you not to, but be ready for the consequences. So John was arrested. That's when this happened. Uh, secondly, where did this happen? You see that in the second part of verse 14. Jesus came to Galilee. Now, if you've been to the Holy Land, and I have not, but I have looked at a lot of different things, and I have the... Let's see, the New English Translation of the Bible, which is a fairly new translation, but in the back of it is a seven-foot-long map of the Holy Land 
from a perspective of the satellite. It's an actual photograph. You can look at the areas there. But, of course, things have changed a little bit. Galilee, of course, was the area where Jesus came preaching. Now, you may not realize this, but there's notable cities in this region. One of them is Bethsaida. I think if we said it right, we would probably say Bethsaida. The name means house of fishing. Some of you guys probably say, well, that would be a good place to live. Well, it was located on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Scholars tell us that it was located about a mile from where the Jordan ran into the Sea of Galilee. And you may not think that's very far today, but in Jesus' time, a mile was a pretty good ways because you had to walk it. 5,280 feet. 1,760 yards. For those of you in the metric system, I don't have any idea how long that is. But this mile seemed to be a little bit too far for fishing in ancient times. But think about who was from this city. Philip, Peter, and Andrew. All three came from Bethsaida. James and John possibly came from there. We don't know for sure. And then there was the city of Capernaum. This was the center for Jesus' ministry. You see that in Matthew 4, verse 13. This town or city was cursed by Jesus. Its location is not known because the curse was actually fulfilled. In Matthew eleven twenty three, 23, we read this. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. What a curse. Very similar to what Billy Graham said years ago. If this country does not repent, God will have to bring up Sodom and Gomorrah from the dead and apologize. And then there was the town of Chorazin, another town that was cursed by Jesus in the very previous verse, Matthew 11, verse 22, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Why would he curse these cities? Because he could do no mighty work there. Unbelief. It hasn't changed much, has it? And then there was the town of Nazareth. <laughs> we know a little bit about this place. It was the place of Jesus' youth. He probably knew everything about Nazareth because he grew up there. He preached his first sermon there in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 and following. His hearers reacted so strongly to his message that Jesus left and made Capernaum his mission center. He did no mighty work in Nazareth. And then there was the little town of Cana of Galilee. Jesus performed his first miracle there. In John, we have the details. And if you remember, even Nathaniel was from Cana. But not only that, Jesus met a centurion whose son, it was from Capernaum. And John records this in John chapter 4. And then there was the city of Nain, N-A-I-N. We don't know much about this place except Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead. That's pretty much all we know. Now you see some of the cities received Jesus, but did not. And it was this area in Galilee that Jesus did most of his preaching. But let's not from the fact that every year, and sometimes more than one time a year, Jesus would always go back to Jerusalem to the temple. And, of course, we know what happened there. But the third question is, what exactly happened? What did happen? And you see that in the third part of verse 14. What does it tell us? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching, and this is probably the 
New American Standard says preaching the gospel of God. The New King James adds the word kingdom of God. But the word gospel, and I think we've talked about this, means good news. Jesus came preaching the good news concerning God. You say, well, Brother Keith, what was this good news? Well, let's put it simply, shall we? Let's don't get too technical. Let's don't go back to the Old Testament and look up a bunch of references. But if you remember the tabernacle in the wilderness, every time the Israelites camped on the way from Egypt to the Promised Land would set up the tabernacle. It had a six and a half foot or seven and a half foot white linen fence around the yard. It one door it into the courtyard and had the tackle building itself or tent. And it was covered with different skins of different animals. And of course, one of those was linen, and that's not the skin of an animal. But it was covered so that when people came by and looked over this fence to see this Thing where supposedly the God of the Hebrews dwelt. They would say the God of the Hebrews lived in a place like that because the outside cover to the tabernacle was badger skin. And you say, you mean an actual badger? Well, I think scholars probably feel that it's probably more like a, a walrus skin or something very thick, very heavy. It's not pretty. And people would look at that and said, their God must not be much to live in a place like that. But the Hebrew knew better. Because you see, there was one door to get in to the tabernacle. And that door curtain, we call it, had three colors in it. It's coming. You had blue. And you had red, and any child can tell you when you mix those two together, you get purple. And purple is the color of royalty. And this door curtain is a picture of Jesus said, I am the door. And this is a perfect picture of him. Because Jesus, being the God-man, takes the blue of heaven and the red of the earth in and one person. But that's not what I want you to see. I could talk about this for hours. I've studied the tabernacle in great detail. It's one of the most fascinating things in the Old Testament. But what's really fascinating, if you go into the front part, items of, you might say, uh, furniture. You had a small altar of incense, and you had loaves of bread on it. And then you had uh, the seven-branch candlestick, the menorah. And you say, what do all those mean? Well, I don't have time to get into that right now. What I want you to see is between that place, the holy place, and the next place, there was a very thick curtain separate from the holy place, the holy of holies, the most holy place. And no Israelite had ever seen what was in there. They had never been in there unless they were the high priest. And the high priest would go into that holy of holies one time a year with blood from a goat. He would sprinkle it on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And I have been told the blood would never touch it. It would be consumed by the glory of God. But you say, well, why do you bring all this up? Well, you see that curtain being very thick, very heavy, was a example to the people of God. You may not come, but why? Because God would say, I am holy, and you aren't. In Southern, God would say, you ain't. Now, I'm sure God doesn't speak that way. But God would say, I'm holy, and you are not. And then years later, when the temple was built, it was the same thing. A very thick veil separated the holy of holies from the holy, holy place. And it was as if God was saying, 
to you and to me and to anyone else. You may not come in here. If you come in here, I will kill you. You say, why would God do something like that? Because he is holy and we're not. You say, well, is that significant? Yes. Matthew records that when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was split from the top to the bottom. Can you imagine the priest in there at this time? Going about his duties in the most, or the holy place, not the most holy place, going about his duties. He's not the high priest. He's never allowed to go into the holy place. And the moment Jesus said, it is finished, a great ripping, tearing sound, and that veil is split in two. And to this priest's horror, he would see what no other human other than the high priest had ever seen, the Ark of the Covenant. You say, well, is that significant? Yes, Paul talks about this in Ephesians. Because you see, for years, God said to people, you cannot come in here. I'm holy. You are sinful. You are a sinful people. But the moment Jesus gave his last breath, God said, what? Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Let's sit down and talk. And he's still calling people today to do that. So the Old Testament stated in concrete terms that the king was coming. And what was the king going to do? Well, the Old Testament even says he was going to right wrongs. He was going to bring people together. What people, Brother Keith? Jews and Gentiles. Has that happened? It has happened to some point. But when Jesus came on the scene, some of them were saying, well, maybe this, maybe this is the king the Old Testament is talking about. We're expecting him to come in on a white horse with an army and free us from the Romans. No, that's not what Jesus came to do. He came proclaiming that the way to God was now open. And he even said it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to God except through me. So he was the way and he was the king. But if you compare what Jesus preaches with John's message, there's a similarity there. What did they preach? And that's what we ought to preach today. Repent. Baptism was a symbol of their repentance. What did Jesus preach? He preached repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins. And then how did Jesus baptize? John even said it. With the Holy Spirit and fire. You say, well, I don't want to be baptized in fire. You got to be. You have to be. Jesus baptized by the Holy Spirit. Stand here and then the Holy Spirit poured over us. That's the Holy Spirit. Baptizing or who does it? Number four, why did why did all of these things happen? Time is fulfilled. Repent and believe in the gospel. Number one, what did Mark mean by saying that? Because he's quoting the Lord Jesus Christ. The time is fulfilled. Well, in Galatians 4, 4, I'm not going to have you turn there just for time.
all. So here is a different idea. So when we talk about the time being fulfilled, we mean that it was the pro appropriate time. And Ephesians 1.10, and I'm reading out of Williams' translation, so that at the coming of the climax of the ages, everything in heaven and on earth should be unified through Christ. And then 1 Timothy 2.6 in the same translation, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a fact that was testified to at the proper time. So this time being fulfilled means at the appropriate or the proper time. You say, well, is that significant? Very much so. Because you see, Jesus had to be born at a time when crucifixion was how a person was put to death. I've even thought about this, and I thought about this years ago. What if God had waited until now to send his son? Well, we don't have crucifixion, do we? We don't, we don't even have the guillotine. And by the way, you know, people that deserve to be put to death, I've always thought that the guillotine would be the best form because nobody gets up and walks away after that. You say, well, is that what you want to happen to yourself? No, of course, and I don't think you do either. So the time is fulfilled means at the appropriate or the proper time. God sent his son to this earth at the right time. And there's plenty of scripture and history to support that claim because if you remember in Rome at this time there was a saying all roads lead to Rome what does that mean they had a very good road system it wasn't paved but it was patrolled and when I say that there were markers along the road to tell you how far you had to go or how far you had come and you say, well, we have that on the interstate highways today. Folks, that was 2,000 years ago they had those. We're not the first ones. We often think people back then were dumb and ignorant, you know, like cavemen. That is not the case. I look at Noah build an ark that would astound builders today with absolutely no training other than God said, I'll tell you what to do and I'll show you how to do it. The time is fulfilled. The second thing he says, and it's right here in the text, and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near. That's the idea. You say, but Brother Keith, what does that mean? Well, in a sense, you see, the kingdom of God was a person, Jesus Christ. But in another sense, the kingdom was still coming. And we'll talk about that later. And Jesus said about this kingdom of God, believe in or put your trust in this good news. And of course, the first question comes to mind, well, what is this good news? What is, what is it that God is trying to tell us? God has come near. Because you see, for hundreds of even thousands of years, the average person like you or me could not go into the presence of God. We couldn't do it. We would have to go to our priest and have him do that, represent us. But when that veil was torn from top to bottom, it wasn't so much that we could come to God, but that God has come to us in the person of his son. We can now come to God through Jesus Christ. And you see, under the old way, or you might say the old covenant, none of this was possible. You say, well, how did God speak to Noah and Moses and Abraham and Joshua and people like that? I don't know. I wasn't there. We don't know for sure. Could God have impressed their minds so that they understood what he wanted them to know? Yes, he could have done that. Could he have spoken in an audible voice? Many times in the Old Testament, it seemed that's what God did. He spoke in an audible voice. They heard it. They understood it. They acted upon it. See, none of this 
what we have today was possible under the old covenant. That's all changed. We have the new covenant. We have the new testament. And that does not take away anything from the old. As a matter of fact, if you look in the old, you'll find the new in it. And if you look in the new, you will find it explaining the old. Because one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible is in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Listen to what the writer says. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, here it comes by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now we understand what that was in the tabernacle and what that was in the temple. The veil. Isn't that what one of our Christmas carols say? Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, the incarnate deity. I pray that this Christmas season you understand that Jesus is God. He is also human. We call him the God-man. He is 100% God and 100% man. You say, well, how can that be? You can write a paper on it. You can write books on it. And I don't think you will ever get to the bottom of it. Why? Because Paul says it is a mystery. How... God can be a man and yet God. You say, well, isn't that what happened in the, you know, uh, wasn't Hercules part man and part God? Where do you think they got the idea from? Where do you think they get these ideas? Debbie and myself and my two grandchildren were watching a Christmas movie last night. And, you know, Santa Claus was in the movie. And I love Santa Claus. I never met him. I sat on his lap one time and told him what I wanted for Christmas, and I didn't get it, so I stopped believing in him right then. But I, I appreciate what, you know what I'm saying. I, I don't have a problem with a jolly man, uh, chunky like me in a red suit. I don't have a problem with that. But in this movie, they were talking, this, this Santa Claus character was talking about whether people believed in him or not, and what he had to do to get them to believe in him. And I said, you know, that sounds very much like the New Testament. You can try and put down Jesus Christ, but he comes out everywhere. I mean, even the Star Wars, and you know it started out as a trilogy, now it's a what? How many of them are there now, and they're just about to come out with one the end of this month? It was a trilogy. But you know, I've watched the first one, I don't know how many times, and there is a messianic theme in Star Wars, because you see the hero is the sun, and you can try to get away from that all you want, and you just can't do it. You know something else that Hollywood picks up on, and I'm not, I'm not praising them, I'm just saying they can't help it because it's true. And that's this idea of one person sacrificing for another. Oh, they want to make movies out of that. They win Academy Awards, all kind of things like this. Because a person is so self-sacrificing that it touches something inside of us and helps us realize that's what God did for us. So when you watch movies, and I know you do, look for those themes. Because he can't help it. You say, well, George Lucas, we don't know anything about his theology. Well, I know something about Steven Spielberg's theology. He is a Jew. He doesn't believe in the Messiah. And it came out very clearly in Star Wars. Folks, the thing that I want to get you to see is it's really clear this new and living way that Jesus brought to our attention. We don't have, well, we have this little bitty curtain separating this part of the building from that one. But if you want to go look back there, you can. 
there's nothing back there but a baptismal pool. And you may see a lizard or something or a roach. We try to get all those out of there before we baptize you. Sometimes we make it, sometimes we don't. But we don't have anything like that in our church, do we? Why? Because you don't need all of that. The old covenant has been done away. It's been replaced with a new covenant. And this new covenant, according to these two verses, is a covenant of blood. And Jesus said, I'm going to sign this covenant with my blood. Will you sign it? Will you come on board, Jesus says. Will you come to the Father through me? Will you believe in me so you can have your sins forgiven? You see, the gospel message is always the same. Now, people can talk about it, and sometimes they do, and they leave out parts of it. But Jesus did that. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? You must be born again. Did Jesus tell Nicodemus to repent? Nope. You say, why is that? Nicodemus was a Jew. He was a or one who studied the Old Testament. He knew what the Old Testament said. And when Jesus said, if you will look at the Old Testament, you will see me on every page, it opened Nicodemus' eyes. So the point that I want you to understand is the gospel message is still the same. Repent and believe the gospel. It hasn't changed. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, folks, I can't tell you that. Can you tell anyone how to believe in something? You can tell them to, but you can't tell them how. And the scripture doesn't say that. It just says, do it. It's not difficult. If you'll come to God, Jesus said, if you will come to me, Believing who I am, who God is, and who you are, I will take you, and I will keep you, and I will keep you forever. If you remember, though, repentance is granted. You can't do it just any time you want to. That's the scary part about it, isn't it? That's why over and over in the New Testament we see this urgency of the gospel message. You need to do this now because you are not promised one more second. None of us are. God has to give repentance or we cannot do it. So when we hear his voice, when we feel his spirit speaking to us, we need to do something about it right then. You have to take advantage of it when it's offered. Because you see, if it's offered today, it might not be tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his message here. Thank you for Mark recording this for our benefit so that we might not only see that Jesus came preaching the good news, and the good news consists of repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, and your sins will be taken away. There will be no record of them. No one can charge you. God takes them upon his own son. And Father, I pray that this Christmas season we'll realize, yes, we're going to see nativity scenes with a baby in the manger and Mary and Joseph and shepherds and we're going to see wise men and animals and all that kind of thing. And Lord, we're used to seeing that. But the bottom line is that baby in the manger did not die for our sins. He grew to be a man to do that. So I pray this advent, this first coming of Jesus will help us see what we need to do now. 
Speak to hearts. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.